Hello and welcome to this introductory clip on NMR. Um, we're going to look at the theory and apply it to carbon-13 NMR, which is the more simple of the two versions of NMR that you need for A-level. So if we look at this animation, it shows a nucleus spinning in a magnetic field. So therefore that will must mean that the nucleus itself must be behaving like a tiny magnet. However, this will only happen if you actually have um, an odd number of nucleons in the nucleus of the atom. So examples of atoms where the nucleus will respond like this would be carbon-13, um, hydrogen-1, phosphorus-31, and fluorine-19. So these are four examples of atoms that would actually respond to, uh, well, their nuclei would respond to having an applied magnetic field put in place. If you had an atom that had an even number of nuclei, or nucleons, sorry, uh, in that case it wouldn't spin. So just to sum this up, this spin only happens if there's an odd number of nucleons, not if there's an even number. So this means we can choose which particular elements uh, we want to analyse. So this means that if we wanted to analyse the number of carbon environments, we could use a carbon-13 NMR spectrometer. If we wanted to, to analyse the number of hydrogen environments, we could use an NMR spectrometer as well. If we wanted to analyse the number of phosphorus environments or the number of fluorine environments, we could also use an NMR spectrometer to tell us this. So first we need to go back to basics. What happens when you put a spinning nucleus, or what happens when you put a nucleus that's going to spin into a magnetic field? It can spin one of two ways. It can either spin with the magnetic field, in which case it will possess lower energy, or if it possesses higher energy, it has enough to spin against the magnetic field, so it opposes the magnetic field. We call these two states the ground state and the excited state. And depending on the chemical environment that nucleus is in, this difference will have a, a signature value. So the energy that we use to actually put a nucleus into an excited state from a ground state, the difference in the two energy levels you can see in the diagram in the top left corner of the screen, if you actually provide exactly that amount of energy using the radio frequency radiation, then what will happen is that the, uh, the nucleus will start to resonate or flip between the two states, excited and ground state. And what happens is that the absorption of that energy to make that flipping and that resonance work um, is picked up by the, the, new, the NMR spectrometer and it's converted into a spectrum, which you can see over here. So if delta E matches the value of the radio frequency radiation being applied, your nucleus will resonate and then, therefore we call this, um, this type of spectroscopy nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. So to hold our sample we need a special solvent that isn't, doesn't react with the sample. It's safe to use for the technical staff operating the NMR um, machinery and it's not going to interfere with the spectrum because it only has one environment um, in terms of both carbon and hydrogen. It's the same one, um, CH3 all the way around the molecule. So it's tetrahedral and it's called tetramethyl silane. Four methyl groups attached to one silicon molecule, it's one silicon atom, sorry. So the whole molecule is called tetramethyl silane. So when you look at a spectrum, the way you, you read it is to look at where the peaks sit according to their chemical shift. So their chemical shift is how far downfield they actually are. So downfield is from right to left. And basically uh, they're measured in parts per million, hence the ppm, and the little delta sign, which is here, represents what we call chemical shift. So when you look at a spectrum, you're always looking for what chemical shift your environment might um, come up as. So you can see quite clearly that each chemical environment involves a carbon atom, so at the moment we're looking at carbon-13 NMR spectroscopy. So each carbon atom on this scale uh, will be in a different environment, so the position of its peak on the spectrum is going to be in a different place. 
So, as a result, GMS provides a reference peak against which other peaks in the spectrum are judged. So sometimes this is also referred to as a standard, so you can call it a standard or you can call it a reference peak. But the important thing is to remember its function. So just to remind you, TMS's peak will be located at this point, so everything else is downfield of it. So that movement downfield is called the chemical shift, and the chemical shift is uh, determined by the degree of spin of the carbon nuclei. So if you look at this typical um, carbon NMR spectrum, and we were to focus on the individual carbon environments, you can see that they're in different environments in each case. And as a result, you get a different peak for each one. So I'm not going to point out the obvious here. You can obviously have a look at the, um, the carbon environments on the data sheet, which is the part we've just discussed, and then match them to the appropriate place on the spectrum. Now might be a good idea to pause the video and have a think about that. So obviously this is one way in which you could tell the difference in a spectroscopic way between the two isomers um, of C3H6O. So here's one for you to think about. If you look at these um, structural isomers of each other, they're all C8H8. So uh, basically they're aromatics, obviously, and you've got different substituents coming off. The colour coding is easy enough to work out as to how many carbon environments you've got. So it should be fairly obvious that because you've got four environments, four peaks, in other words, in your carbon-13 NMR spectrum, it's going to be this compound here, because there's only four environments in that compound, whereas there's five environments in the two of the others, and three environments in one. In other words, four peaks, four environments. So let's have a look at a couple of practice examples. So if we were to analyse this uh, spectrum more closely using the data, you can see quite clearly that the three peaks that are in the 130, uh, sorry, the 125 to 138 region, uh, round about uh, here, these peaks obviously match the aromatic region here. Such would represent the environments in these carbons on the benzene ring. This peak over here falls into the carbon-carbon category, so that peak would represent the two um, methyl groups coming off that particular molecule. So one possible chemical reason for this might be that the delocalized electrons in the pi system in the aromatic ring are potentially more reactive than the methyl groups. So they might get involved in something like electrophilic substitution, for example, whereas the methyl groups would be fairly un un uh, pretty resistant to any kind of reactivity. So the peaks of potentially more reactive groups uh, and the environments that they represent will be dirt further downfield. So in the same way that oxygen seems to be attached to the carbons that are further downfield, nitrogen seems to be attached to the carbons that are further downfield, that would be what you'd expect. So if you're looking to two different environments and trying to work out why one is further downfield than another. The electronegativity of the atom to which the carbon is bonded plays a key role. So furthest downfield in this region you have atoms that are double bonded to more electronegative atoms such as nitrogen or oxygen. If you were to look in the middle range around here you get a lot of pi bond activity, carbon-carbon double bonds and pi rings. So that tends to um, be slightly more reactive due to uh, higher electron density in the case of carbon-carbon double bonds and uh, the delocalized pi system can potentially get involved in electrophilic activity as well. If you were to go further upfield, so I'm heading towards the right of the screen now, you'll notice that all of these ones are single bonded so there's no double bonds at all. They're single bonded, and even then, if you look at the, uh, the most electronegative non-carbon atom, it happens to be oxygen. In other words, the oxygen is here. That's more electronegative than all of the other atoms in those groups, in those um, environments. So it sits slightly further downfield than the others. 
So therefore, electronegativity must play quite a key role. So it's also worth remembering the different factors that can affect the position of where a peak is going to be in your spectrum. It helps your understanding of what's going on with the spin as well, the nuclear spin. So your turn to have a think about this. Uh, this spectrum belongs to a compound that has a molecular formula of C3H6O, which is either one of those two possibilities. Which one is it actually going to be? Pause the video and have a think about this. So hopefully you were able to see that it was going to be propanol. There's three peaks, so three carbon environments. Okay, so I think it's time to try a short exam question before we wrap things up on this clip. So here's a typical exam question, getting you to look at um, disubstituted nitrobenzenes. So you've got 1,2-dinitrobenzene in uh, compound W, 1,3-dinitrobenzene uh, is compound X, and 1,4-dinitrobenzene is compound Y. It asks you to give the number of peaks in the carbon-13 NMR spectrum of each isomer. So looking at compound W, you have three peaks, as it will have three carbon environments. So you can see that compound Y has two peaks, as it actually has two carbon environments. One carbon environment is the one that the NO2 is attached to on the benzene ring, and the other carbon environment is the other carbons that are all next to a carbon where an NO2 is actually attached. So if you think about it carefully, you'll see that all of these carbons here so if I was to highlight them, all of these carbons here are next to a carbon that actually has an NO2 attached to it. So let's move the page down and answer the last question. So the next one asks you to draw the displayed formula of the compound used as a standard in recording these spectra. So obviously when you're recording the spectra you're putting it through the mass of the NMR spectrometer so the standard compound that we use to compare all the other peaks against was tetramethylsilane. And you'll notice that they want you to do the displayed formula so therefore you need to be a bit careful here the way you draw it. So every single bond needs to be shown and every single atom needs to be shown. So we're looking at something like that. So it's uh, not just putting anything like this down with CH3s in that manner. Not because that's technically wrong, but that doesn't actually address the displayed formula, does it? Because you've got the CH3s in undisplayed form. So you need to make sure that all bonds are displayed and all atoms are shown. So now what we can do is have a look at the mark scheme which you can see probably at the bottom of the screen I've pasted onto this PDF. So I need to move the screen up again. So looking at our mark scheme, W, X and Y were 3, 4 and 2 peaks respectively, which we got. And the displayed formula you can see quite clearly is uh, very similar to what we've drawn. So it's worth remembering some of these um, small details like displayed formula, etc., and also how to spot when, P when carbon environments are actually the same. As it suggests, it's an easy one to miss, so do be careful of that when you're practicing your own examples. So hopefully this was a fairly useful introductory clip to nuclear magnetic resonance and uh, the simpler um, type of NMR spectra, carbon NMR spectra, and how we read them. I'm not going to cover proton NMR spectra because it's a bit more complicated, so it requires a different video clip. But uh, if you have any questions about carbon NMR or NMR in general, then uh, do contact one of us at college, um, come to a subject extension, or have a chat with your teacher about it, and, uh, and we'll be happy to help. So thanks for your time, thanks for listening, and uh, see you soon.